In this video, we're going to discuss systems of nonlinear equations in two variables. So we've spent some time looking at linear systems. Um, essentially, what we know about linear systems, we can apply in a lot of ways to nonlinear systems with the idea that the graphs behind the equations that we're looking at uh, will potentially be different. They won't necessarily represent lines. They may represent curves. So what is a nonlinear system? Well, when one or more, but only one is necessary, when one or more equations in a system is nonlinear. Say we start with a system of linear equations and take one of the equations and make it a nonlinear equation. In other words, we introduce something other than just linear terms, something other than just exponents of one. So maybe we introduce higher exponents, we can introduce radicals, we can introduce logarithms, lots of different things. If that's the case, if we have at least one equation that's nonlinear, then we'll classify the entire system as a nonlinear systems, as a nonlinear system, excuse me. So we often solve nonlinear systems to identify any points of intersection for functions, for their graphs. So you'll use nonlinear systems, you'll learn to solve for points of intersection uh, when you do integral calculus. There will be certain problems you do where you want to relate more than one function and you need to know where their graphs would intersect in order to solve a particular kind of problem. So using a nonlinear system is going to be helpful. Now it's possible for a nonlinear system to have no solution or one or more solutions. Now when we talk about a linear system, we have very specific cases for what the solutions can look like. We can still have no solution, in which case if you were to graph the two lines or three lines, however many represented, um, no solution means the lines would be parallel. They would never intersect in space. Now one solution means they intersect in one location. If lines intersect, they can only intersect at one point. Or the third possibility is that they are collinear. They actually lay one on top of the other. In other words, if you were to look at the two equations, they may look different, but they are algebraically equivalent. One equation is the same thing as the other, differing just by a constant multiple. Those three situations don't necessarily apply in the same way when we're talking about a nonlinear system. So we can have no solution, which again just means the equations never intersect. It doesn't necessarily mean that the graphs are parallel. It just means there's no location where the two graphs actually coincide with one another. One solution means the same thing. It means the graphs intersect at one point. But more than one doesn't necessarily have to mean infinitely many solutions like it does with lines. If we're talking about functions, we can potentially have maybe two or three points where graphs intersect if we're talking about graphs representing nonlinear functions. So we have to keep in mind that it's not as clear cut in terms of what the pictures are going to look like when we're no longer talking about equations that are linear. We can have lots of different situations in terms of how many solutions we have just based on the fact that we have graphs that are no longer just graphs of lines. So most cases when we want to solve a nonlinear system, we're going to solve using substitution, which is essentially the same technique we use when we use um, linear systems, when we look at linear systems. However, just because we now have equations that are nonlinear, we have additional issues that aren't issues when we're talking about linear equations. So it's going to become more important to check our proposed solutions, the ones we get algebraically, due to the possibility that one or more, possibly, is extraneous. So it's always a good idea to check your solutions. It's always a good idea. You can check them with a linear system. The idea that an ordered pair represents, represents a solution means that if you were to substitute the x and y values into the original equations, that it will satisfy all equations in the system. It's possible when we solve a nonlinear system that will come up with a solution, but it doesn't actually work in maybe one of the equations in the original system. The techniques we have to use to solve equations that are nonlinear can potentially introduce extraneous solutions. So it's potential that we run into something that can't be solved, or maybe we just run into a solution that doesn't exist over the set of real numbers. Maybe it would require us to get into complex numbers. 
We're ultimately looking for solutions that represent something physically present on the coordinate plane, on our standard real coordinate plane. So if we ever run into a situation where a solution would require us to get into the complex numbers, then we'll say that it doesn't have a solution or that that solution in particular um, doesn't actually apply to the system. Now substitution will look exactly the same as it does for a linear system, but now we're just looking at slightly more complicated equations. So let's look at this first one. We want to solve the system using substitution. Now just to review substitution in general, the idea is that we want to pick one of the variables, either x or y, in one of the equations, and we want to isolate it. And so we end up with an expression of that variable in terms of the other variable in the problem. We then substitute for that variable in the other equation, and the result is that we combine the two original equations together, creating a new one that only has one variable. So whereas the original two equations have two variables, when we combine them using substitution, we now have a new equation that only has one variable. So as before, we can ultimately choose to isolate either variable in either equation, but the general idea is we want to isolate one ideally that will lead us to simple algebra. In other words, if isolating a variable requires us to maybe divide out something which would potentially create fractions, or for instance in our second equation, if we were to try to isolate x or y, we'd have to take a square root. That potentially introduces some problems as well. We want to avoid those kinds of things if we can. So in this case, I'm gonna label my equations as one and two. We know we have to use both throughout the substitution method. In this case, the easiest variable to isolate will be this variable x in our first equation. It only has a coefficient of negative one, so isolating x is not going to require us to potentially create any fractions where there weren't any before. So I'm gonna take equation one, and I want to isolate x. Now I can move things to either side. In this case, I'm gonna add my seven y and move it over. So that means negative x is equal to 50 plus 7y. Now be careful, x is not quite isolated. We still need to divide out that negative one. So that means x is equal to negative 50 minus 7y. So both of those signs switch places. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna plug that into my second equation in place of x. So this is now an expression for x in terms of y. Wherever I see an x, I could put negative 50 minus 7y because they're algebraically equivalent. Now make sure when you substitute, make sure you don't substitute into the same equation you already used. That's why it's a good idea to label your equations. Once you've used equation one, you now have to move on and use equation two. So I'm gonna replace x with this expression. Because x is squared, when I substitute, I'm going to put parentheses around what I'm substituting. Okay, is equal to 100. Okay, so now we have a new equation that only has the variable y, which means I can now solve for y. Now this binomial is now being squared, which means I have to FOIL this out. I can't just square negative 50, square negative 7y, and then go from there. I have to FOIL this all out. So it may help in this case to actually write out what's being distributed, just so we make sure we don't make any mistakes here. Since this now represents four multiplications, not just two. Okay, so first, negative 50 times negative 50, it's gonna be positive, and then 50 times 50 is going to be 2,500. So positive 2,500, and then negative 50, times negative seven y, well it's gonna be positive. Five times seven is 35, so 50 times seven is gonna be 350. So positive 350y. Okay, now notice the inner multiplication, same thing. So positive 350y. And then negative seven y times negative seven y is going to be positive 49y squared. And then we still have our additional positive y squared, and that is equal to 100. So 
So let's combine all our like terms, clean it up. So 49y squared plus an additional y squared is going to be 50y squared. 350y and another 350y is going to be 700y plus 2500. And that is going to be equal to 100. Okay, now anytime we want to factor, we need to make sure we have everything on one side and we have zero on the other side. So I'm gonna go ahead and move my 100 over, subtract it, move it over, get a zero on the other side. So we have 50y squared plus 700y, and then subtract the 100, which gives us 2400. And that's equal to zero. Okay, now originally, initially, right now, this looks like a fairly complicated factoring problem, but it doesn't necessarily have to be as long as we know what to do next, logically speaking. What I notice now is that every single one of these terms has a common factor of 50. So this coefficient in front of the y squared that ultimately makes this a more challenging factoring problem can actually be divided out from all three of these terms. And as long as we do the same thing to both sides of the equation, we keep everything in balance. So if I divide out the 50 on the other side, notice it's still a zero and we're still in a good position to be able to factor. So I wanna do that. I wanna take each of those terms and I wanna divide out the 50. So if I divide it out from the first term, of course that's just gonna leave me with a y squared Okay, then 700 divided by 50, if you need to get a calculator, do so. 700 divided by 50 is gonna give me 14. So plus 14y. And then 2400 divided by 50, is gonna give me 48. So plus 48. And keep in mind, we are dividing 50 into zero as well, but the result is just zero. And now we have a much simpler equation to factor that's still equivalent to the original equation, just a different, more simplified form. So now I'm looking for numbers that multiply to give 48 that would also add to give me 14. So what different options do I have? Well, 48 would be one and 48, or two and 24, let's see, three and 16, four and 12, what else, six and eight, okay, so six times eight is 48. If we take six and eight and add them together, we get a 14, so it looks like that's gonna work. So we have y plus six, and then y plus eight is equal to zero, which means y could be negative six, or it could be negative eight. Both of those are values. Now because we find two y values, that also means that we can find two x values. So we need to keep that in mind. So for each of these individual y values, we'll solve for an associated x value. Now this is a good place to resubstitute and solve. Based on these individual values of y, we can plug in here and this will give us an associated x value. So let's start with y equals negative six. So for y equals negative six, x would be negative 50 minus seven times negative six, which is gonna be negative 50, and then seven times six is 42, so plus 42. And then negative 50 plus 42 is gonna give me negative eight. So one proposed solution would be the ordered pair, negative eight, negative six. And then if y is equal to negative eight, then x is equal to negative 50 minus seven times negative eight. So negative 50 plus 56, negative 50 plus 56, which would give us positive six. So our proposed ordered pairs would be negative eight, negative six, and then positive six, negative eight. And then ideally we want to check both of these ordered pairs in our original equations. So this is something you can do on the calculator if you want. So negative negative eight would be positive eight, and then negative seven times negative six 
Well, that's going to be, what, 42? Positive 8 and 42 combines to give us 50. And then x squared plus y squared, that would be 8 squared, which is 64, plus negative 6 squared, which is 36. 64 plus 36 combines to give me 100. So this particular one does work. So negative 8, negative 6 is a solution. Okay, what about the next one? 6 and negative 8. So negative 6 and then negative 7 times negative 8 is 56. So 6 and then, or excuse me, negative 6 and 56 is going to give me 50. And then 6 squared and negative 8 squared, 36 and 64 combines to give me 100. So both of these ordered pairs represent solutions to my system. So notice in this case, we have two variables, two equations, and we end up having two solutions. So unlike a linear system, where if we find a unique solution, there's only one of them, here we have two separate solutions, both of which solve this system of equations. So what do these ordered pairs represent? Well, if we were to graph these two equations, this first one is linear, the second one actually represents the equation of a circle. These two ordered pairs represent the two locations where the graph of this line and the graph of this circle would intersect. Okay, so let's look at another one, slightly more complicated. So the first one had a linear equation, only one of them was nonlinear. In this case, both of our equations are nonlinear, but we can still work this, the problem the same way. And notice in this case, if we look at equation one versus equation two. In equation two, we already have one variable isolated, which means that substitution is gonna be pretty straightforward here. So we're gonna use equation two, which has y in terms of x, and we're gonna substitute that expression into equation one. So using equation one, we're gonna replace y with three times the square root of x minus eight quantity. So x minus five, squared plus our y squared and we're substituting and that's squared and that's going to be equal to 25. Okay so now we need to solve for x. It looks like there's already some factorization done for us but it's not going to help here number one because there's not a zero on the other side of the problem. So we want to distribute everything out, recombine everything, move our 25 over, and then we'll refactor once there's a zero on the other side. So our initial binomial, that needs to be foiled out. So that's going to be x squared minus 10x plus 25. And then in our next set of parentheses where we're squaring, there's nothing to foil necessarily, but we do need to be careful here. There's two factors, one of them is rational, one of them is radical. We need to square the three and we need to square that square root individually. So the three is gonna become a nine when we square it, so plus nine. And then the square root of x minus eight when we square it, the square and square root are inverses, they cancel, that's just gonna become an x minus eight. And then because three is multiplied by this square root, it's gonna to have to be multiplied, multiplied by the result as well. So I'm gonna put parentheses around that x minus eight once it appears so that all of this is multiplied correctly. And then that is equal to 25 still. So let's distribute, distribute that nine. So x squared minus 10x plus 25 plus 9x and then nine times eight is 72. So minus 72 is equal to 25. So now we need to move our 25 over. We need to combine our like terms. We can do it in two steps. We can do it in one. One thing I notice here is this 25, if I were to subtract it and move it over to get the zero that I need, notice we have a 25 on the other side as well. So subtracting it to move it over, it will just combine with this 25 and essentially it's just eliminated. So all we really have to do now is just combine our like terms. So we have x squared, then negative 10x plus 9x is gonna give us negative x. The 25 was eliminated, and so we're just left with that negative 72. 
and the zero on the other side. So this is now what we want to factor, and because it's quadratic, there's potentially two solutions to this equation. So we want numbers that multiply to give negative 72, that also add to give negative one. So nine and eight multiply to give 72, and then if we want the result of the addition to be a negative one, well then we would want a negative nine and then a positive eight. So our factors would be x minus nine, and then x plus eight. So that means x is either negative eight or positive nine. So just like with the previous problem, we end up with two potential values for one of our variables, which are gonna to correspond to two values for our other variable. So we need to determine what the y values would be associated with x is negative eight and x is nine. Notice our second equation, again, that was where we substituted from. We already have an expression for y in terms of x. So we can just sub in these values to this equation, and then we can solve for y in that way. So using equation two, first we'll let x be negative eight, and then I wanna sub in to see what y would have to be. So if x is negative eight, y is going to be three times the square root of negative eight minus eight, which is going to be three times the square root of negative 16, red flag. Notice we have that negative under the square root. So we could take this a step further, but this is going to create complex numbers. And the idea is that we're solving this system over the real numbers. We're just looking for solutions that are represented as ordered pairs in our standard x, y coordinate plane. So that means, because we now run into complex solutions, that this x value is extraneous. If it leads us to a y value that's complex, this x value doesn't actually represent a solution to our system. So even though we didn't do anything wrong, algebraically, x equals negative eight is a value that we get. Because it corresponds to a non-real y value, it doesn't actually correspond to a solution to our system. What about x equals nine? Let's see what happens there. So again, sub n, solve for y three times the square root of nine minus eight. Well, nine minus eight is still a positive number, so it looks like we're good. So that's gonna be three times the square root of one. Root one is just one, so three times one is going to be three. So the corresponding ordered pair here, x is nine, and the resulting y is going to be three. Now, before we officially say this is a system though, we need to plug it back in and we need to verify that this does in fact satisfy both of our original equations. So x is nine, let's plug into the first one, x is nine, y is three. So nine minus five is gonna be four, four squared is 16, and then three squared is nine, 16 plus nine is gonna give me 25. So it works in our first equation. What about the second one? We'll plug in x is nine, nine minus eight is one, root one is one, and then times three is three, and then y is three, three equals three, also true. So this is going to be a solution to our system. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what these equations would look like specifically the first one. The first one will also represent a circle, but whereas the first one is a circle centered at the origin, this is a circle that's been shifted off of the origin based on the fact that we've subtracted from our x. Okay, so substitution works for nonlinear systems. We also talked about the addition or the elimination method for solving a linear system. We can use that method with some of our nonlinear systems but it's going to be dependent more so on the form. So if we have a system like this, where there's a variety of different algebraic structures, the addition method may not be a good option, but with some specific cases, the addition method can be used with a nonlinear system. So it specifically can be used when the terms containing the corresponding variables are like terms. In other words, if we were to combine our two equations together with addition, we would be able to actually eliminate terms because we're combining like terms. 
in any other situation where our equations don't meet this requirement, we're going to want to use substitution instead. So let's look at a couple of systems that we can solve using this addition method. So 2x squared plus y squared is equal to 17, and x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 22. So notice if we match up the variables in the two equations, each of the matching terms are considered to be like terms. So we have two quadratic x terms, we have two quadratic y terms. So in this case, this system could be solved using the addition method. So what we want to do, we want to pick one of the variables to eliminate, and we want to get matching but opposite coefficients in order to combine the two equations and eliminate that variable. It's not going to matter which one we choose, ultimately it's just going to be our choice. So suppose we want to eliminate the x terms. Okay, so our first equation has 2x squared. We could eliminate a 2x squared with a negative 2x squared. So if we were to take our second equation, multiply it all by a negative 2, then we'll have matching terms with opposite signs that will cancel out. So I'm going to take my second equation and I'm going to multiply everything in that equation by a negative 2 and then we'll see what happens from there. So I multiply that equation by negative 2, so that's going to be negative 2x squared minus 4y squared and don't forget to multiply on the other side as well. Negative 2 times 22 is going to be negative 44. So watch all your signs. Make sure you distribute to both sides of the equation. Now the other equation we don't need to do anything to because now we have those matching coefficients on x. So I'm going to add those two together. My x terms are eliminated. And so I just combine what I'm left with. So y squared minus 4y squared is going to be negative 3y squared. And then 17 minus 44, let's verify that, it's going to be negative 27. Negative 27. So if I divide out negative 3, I have y squared is equal to positive 9, which means y could be positive or negative 3, either one. Remember, when you have an equation with a square and you take a square root, you need plus minus in order to indicate that two different values could be squared, both a positive and a negative value, in order to give you an output of 9. So again, this means we potentially have two solutions to our system, one corresponding to each of these individual values. Okay. So what's this going to mean when we actually plug things back in? We're going to have to solve for x. So let's start with y is equal to positive 3. And it doesn't matter which equation we use, but I would maybe argue use the second equation, just so we won't have to divide anything out in front of x once we get to that point. So I'm going to sub in, so x squared plus 2 times y squared, so 2 times 3 squared is equal to 22. Okay. So 3 squared is going to give me 9. 9 times 2 is 18. So plus 18 is equal to 22. Move my 18. So x squared is equal to 22 minus 18, which is 4. Which means x could be positive or negative 2. So let's think about this. When y is 3, x could be positive 2 or it could be negative 2. Well, that means we've actually found two ordered pairs just right here. When x is positive 2, y can be 3. When x is negative 2, y can also be 3. So we found two ordered pairs here from only one of our values for y. Now what's going to happen when we plug in y is equal to negative 3? Well, notice how this equation is structured. We're taking our input and we're squaring it. Well, squaring takes a negative and it makes it positive. So when we plug in this negative 3, we actually end up with the exact same thing we had for the previous equation. Negative 3 squared is 9, 2 times 9 is 18, and we're right back where we started, which means the same x values solve this equation as well. x could be positive or negative 
So what do we have now? We actually have four ordered pairs here. X could be positive two, Y could be three. X could be negative two, Y could be three. And then positive two, negative three, and then negative two, negative three. We actually have four ordered pairs that are proposed solutions of this system. Now because we're squaring, positive versus negative doesn't really make a difference here. We square positive two, we get the same value as if we square negative two. Same thing for positive and negative three. So we really only need to check one of the ordered pairs here, knowing that the equations will behave the same way for the other ordered pairs with the different positive and negative values. So let's check maybe just positive two and then positive three. So x is positive two, y is positive three. So if x is positive two, okay, two squared is four, four times two is eight, so this term is eight. Y is three, so three squared is nine. 8 plus 9 gives me 17, so that one works out. Okay, positive 2 squared is 4. Y squared, 3 squared is 9. 2 times 9 is 18, so 4 plus 18 gives me 22. That one checks out as well. And again, because all the other values are the same, at least in terms of their absolute value, they only differ by a sign, those squares are going to behave the same way for all of the different values. So that means all four of these ordered pairs are solutions. So x can be 2, y can be 3, x can be negative 2, y can also be 3, and then x can be 2 and y is negative 3. And then we also have the possibility that they are both negative. So four ordered pairs that represent locations where these equations intersect. Now these equations look kind of similar to the equations for circles, but as it turns out, these don't necessarily represent circles. They represent equations, graphs that are very similar to circles, but again, we'll talk about what those look like a little bit later. They fall under a specific category of graphs that we call conic sections. So the reason, the, the reason we ended up with so many solutions here is because these graphs look a very specific way. Okay, let's look at one more example. Okay, so now again we have two squared terms. The difference here is the sign has changed between them. So we went from two equations that had additions to one equation that has an addition and the one that has a subtraction. So let's see what happens here. So again, addition may be a good option here because we have matching like terms for each of our variables. We can eliminate whatever we want. Let's eliminate the y's this time. So our first equation has a 4y squared. Our second equation has a negative y squared. So we've already got the opposite signs, but if we want to eliminate a 4, we'll want a negative 4. So we're going to take that second equation and we're going to multiply the whole equation by a negative 4 in order to get those matching coefficients. Okay, so that's gonna give us negative four x squared. Negative four times negative y squared is positive four y squared, which is what we wanted. And then negative four times nine is gonna give us negative 36. Okay, so that's gonna be our new equation with this constant multiple and we're combining it with the original version of our first equation. So x squared plus 4y squared is equal to 4. Okay, now our y terms, oops, what did I do here? Negative 4, oh, I should have multiplied by a positive 4, my bad. Okay, let's fix that. So positive 4, so this will become positive. Excuse me, apologize for that. And this will become negative. That was the intent. Okay, and then positive 4 times positive 9 will be positive 36. Okay, so let's fix that now. So there we go. So these terms can combine. These two terms will be eliminated. There we go. So 4x squared plus x squared is going to give me 5x squared. And then 4 plus 36 is going to give me 40. Divide 5. So 5 goes into 40 8 times. So we get x squared is equal to 8. Take the square root. So x is going to be the positive or negative square root of 8. 
We do want to simplify that radical. So 8 is not a perfect square, but 4, a factor of 8, is. So we can take the square root of 4, which is 2, and that leaves us with a factor of 2 under our radical. So two different x values solve this particular equation. Now we need to determine what y would have to be corresponding to these two different x values, positive 2 root 2 and then negative 2 root 2. Now again, ultimately it doesn't matter which one we choose to solve in, but the second one might be a little bit easier, just because when we solve for y, we only have a coefficient of negative 1. We're not going to create fractions unnecessarily. So let's go through and let's determine what y would be based on these two different values of x. So first value, x is equal to positive 2 root 2. And I'm going to plug into my second equation. So that's going to be positive 2 root 2 squared minus y squared is equal to 9. So when we square this, 2 root 2, well remember 2 root 2 is the same thing as root 8. So we're just squaring root 8, which gives me an 8. So 8 minus y squared is equal to 9. Subtract 8, move it over. So that's going to give me a 1. So negative y squared is equal to 1. I divide my negative, which gives me y squared is equal to negative 1. Red flag. If I take the square root here, what's going to happen? I'm going to take the square root of both sides to isolate my y to get rid of that exponent. And then I'm going to take the square root of negative 1, which is then a complex number, which is a problem. We can't actually do that here. Remember, if we're solving over the real numbers and looking for solutions represented on our standard coordinate plane. So that means this x value doesn't actually correspond to a solution for our system because it leads us to a y value that's a complex number. What about the other one though? So negative 2 root 2. Well imagine what will happen if we plug that one in as well. We plug it in here and we're squaring. Well squaring 2 root 2 and squaring negative 2 root 2 is going to lead to the same value. If we square that negative, the negative becomes a positive. So all we're really squaring there at that point is the 2 root 2, which will lead us again to an 8 and the same conclusion. So x is equal to negative 2 root 2. Same problem. I'll write a note. Same problem. We end up with something that's complex. So that means this x value also doesn't correspond to a solution. Well, based on our addition technique, these are the only two x values that are proposed solutions to our system. If both of these x values lead us to a complex y value, which means they don't actually correspond to solutions to our system, well then we're stuck. Ultimately, that means at that point, there is no solution to our system. If we were solving over the complex numbers, then we could write complex solutions. But since we're talking about actual numbers that we can graph over the real numbers, that we're not going to be able to solve this particular system. There's going to be no solution, which ultimately means if we were to graph these two equations, their graphs are not going to have any points of intersection. That's what no solution means in this case. So in general, regardless of the system you're looking at, if you find that there's no solution, it just means that the corresponding graphs are not going to have any points of intersection. So that gives you a few different examples, different kinds of systems you can run into, different situations involving how many solutions you run into. Ultimately, nonlinear systems can vary a lot depending upon the equations we have, what sort of algebraic structures are represented. And again, you're going to use nonlinear systems once you get to integral calculus. You're looking for locations where graphs are going to intersect, specifically graphs of nonlinear equations.